Okay, if you have your Bibles, take them out. Turn to the book of Jeremiah. And we are going to begin a new journey. And we left off uh, the book of Isaiah. So Isaiah prophesied about 60 years before Jeremiah. So we pick it up. And Jeremiah is prophesying, sort of, he is picking up the same theme that Isaiah was prophesying about in regards to the condition of the children of Israel. So up to chapter 25, Jeremiah is talking about the, the precondition of Israel before they are taken cap into captivity. So in the book of Jeremiah, we actually get them taken into captivity, that part. In the book of Isaiah, you, you remember, so they, they were close to being taken into captivity, but God spared them. Jerusalem was surrounded. The Assyrians were coming, just really like destroying the whole land. And they got to Jerusalem, the capital city, God's city, and they were bearing down on it. And then they had 185,000 soldiers surrounding Israel. And Israel thought, this is it, but God saved them. And that was where Hezekiah was seeking the Lord. He was the king at that time. And, and he just, you know, he spread everything before the Lord and prayed and God intervened. But that was just sort of buying time. So now we're, we're here. Now we're uh, 60 years later. In Isaiah, God had already told the children of Israel that you will be taken captive. And he also told them, you'll be taken captive, but you'll also be let go. And he also told them, you'll be taken captive, you'll be let go. And here's the guy who's going to let you go. And if you're reading through your one year, you just read that part. It was King Cyrus, right? Amazing prophecy. God named the guy 150 years, I think it was, before they actually, he actually let him go. So now in Jeremiah, so um, some of you may know, there's, uh, people think of Jeremiah as what? Happy-go-lucky guy or what how weeping. weeping guy yeah um now here's the thing so i want to think about two things um as we get into this we're we're calling the book of jeremiah courageous or courage because of of one thing in particular about jeremiah so jeremiah preached and prophesied and had zero results. Literally zero results. You, you know the feeling? So um, say if you're a parent, you have a prodigal child, and you, you see them slowly slipping down the slope into the abyss, going step by step, and, and, and you just see these little things start to happen, these little things that... You know it's not good, and it's just a slow, and you can't stop it. And you can warn, you can say something, you, and you can't stop it. You just see the world just like engulfing them. You may have friends, family members, coworkers, whatever, and you can see it, and you can see it happening. And and so that's what Jeremiah is preaching on. But the reason he's a weeping prophet is because his heart was broken. It's that same type of thing to see people you love go off into a place that's very dark and bad. It's a, he's, he's broken hearted. So yeah, it's a, it's a, he's a weeping prophet because he's broken hearted. He, he, has, he, he cares so much about his people. He, he's just broken hearted. But then he has the courage to speak the truth when it's not popular when people don't get it, when people don't respond to it, and in fact, when he's going to be harmed because of it. And we'll see that all through the book. So uh, we're calling the book uh, Courageous or Courage because you'll, you're going to see it's not much different in, in Jeremiah's time than it is now. The parallels are going to blow you away. And we are living in the last days. Jeremiah was preaching in the last days of Israel before they were being judged and taken captive, but we're living in the last days too. 
Of course, we don't know how long, but for sure we're in the last days. So we're, in, we're last days people. So we should see some parallels, right? Because throughout human history, the parallels in judgment that we've seen in the Bible. So uh, the world was judged in the great flood. Sodom and Gomorrah was judged, the city. And then we have the judgment of the children of Israel, um, we have uh, several judgments. You go through the book of uh, Judges. Um, you see, if you go through the Kings, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, you go through that. So you see the, th this judgment. But this is a unique judgment because they're actually going to be disposed from the land and taken out and taken captive. But see, so there's parallels to last days times. So you can find parallels to the flood, to Sodom and Gomorrah, to the children of Israel here, and to our day and age here. It's, it's, it's uncanny. So you may feel like a prophet, so to speak, in these last days. You may feel the same frustration, the same heartbreak, that friends, family, loved ones, you see them going down and, and you say stuff and it doesn't mean anything what you say. I've heard that before. Oh, yeah, 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 you always say that. Yeah, that type of thing. That was his audience. But get this. This is interesting. So, you know, in our day and age, now we think of a good pastor, usually as somebody who has an extremely large following. And we think they're, they say things like, man, that's powerful. Or people say, I always hate when I hear this. This is just my pet peeve. But you hear things, oh, that person hit it out of the park today. You know, like, because they're preaching, they hit it out of the park. And it's just... If you say that, I'm not saying, you know, anything bad. I'm just saying it bothers me because that's how we view the sermon a lot of times. Like, man, he really got it that time. And so now the pastor has to sort of, you know, have this thing going to get people to think he's, he's really powerful instead of just teaching the word. And what people need in our day and is, is the teaching of the Word more than anything. Learning how to walk with the Lord, how to follow Him, how to truly be a disciple of Him. Pretty much, mostly in our culture, uh, people know the stuff, they know the information, they just don't care about it. And, and, and that's not always the case. And we should be preaching the Gospel wherever we go, whenever we can. But the point is, is, Mostly, like in our text, it's not the lack of information, it's the lack of want to. It's, I don't care. It's that sort of attitude. So I'm, I'm saying that because I'm trying to get you to get a feel of what it would be like to be Jeremiah in that time. So, now, with zero results, with zero what people would say, you know, hitting out of, out of the park, with zero pop and bang, Jeremiah is very well known, isn't he? Is he known for all his converts and how radical and how... He was known for his faithfulness. He was known for his strength to walk the walk, to talk the talk, regardless of how anybody else reacted. And sometimes that's very difficult, isn't it? You feel alone sometimes. You feel like, man, it just seems like it's shriveling up. It seems like that, that whole remnant thing in the Bible, it's really a remnant it seems like. And so we need to walk humbly before the Lord. We need to be prayerful in our dealings in the world. We need to be watchful over our own life. And it's amazing on Sunday how this parallels with what we talked about Sunday with the, um, the worldliness and, and waging war against worldliness. I don't know how to better say this, but it's really bad. It's really bad what's happening. The denial of God, even within Christianity, the next generation coming up, and the passionless Christianity, which is becoming so worldly. In 10 to 15 years, there's not going to be much of the church. I'm not being alarmist. This is just fact. So with that, the last thing I want to say introduction-wise is the book of Jeremiah, I want to ask you 
to commit to seeing it through. Because, uh, and was, was anybody, I know some of you, who was here through the whole book of Job? Is anybody here through that? A couple of hands. Anybody else? Uh, was that just an itch or Mary? Or, okay. Okay. Is that one of those? Well, it's a grind. It's a grind. The whole book of Job is a, a grind. You know, it starts off, you know, bad and then it gets worse <laughs> and then it gets better. But Jeremiah, I, I just hope that we have to be a people that are balanced and we have to be a people that regardless of what section of the scripture we're in, that, that we know that we expect God to do something great through that section of scripture. He uses all his scripture for all of his purposes. So so we have to be in tune like that. I had one person one time, we were going through the, I, I, it was First or Second Chronicles or First or Second Kings, which is basically just, you know, all the kings, going all through the kings and all the judgment that happened, there are very few good kings. And a person told me they can't come anymore because it's just too much of that judgment stuff. And, and they couldn't come anymore to, to, to the study. And I, I thought, you know, that's sad because all God's Word is breathed by Him and all of it has a purpose. God doesn't waste anything. He doesn't just put stuff in here to waste our time. In fact, the, um, John, the Gospel of John, it says that there, he couldn't even contain all the stuff if he wrote everything about Jesus. He just put in there everything that was really succinct and we needed to know, but he couldn't write everything. So we have to believe that every word here is purposeful. But I, I, I think you're going to find it pretty fascinating and maybe you'll be encouraged to really view this in light of our times and the days that we live in. So let's just jump right in. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 1, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anath in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah the son of Ammon, the king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. So you got all that? <laughs> it's a lot of information. It's okay if you don't get all that. But see, here's what's great about the Bible. We get all this detail because um, a scribe is recording this. And he, he's anchoring time frames. This is not general stuff. This is a historical record that we're reading. And he's writing it so we have time frames. We have places, dates, things like that. And so all those things are very pertinent to when this is all happening and to understand that this is actually a fulfillment of prophecy. So watch this. He says, verse 4, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. So Jeremiah, it's interesting, he was called, he was ordained, sanctified, equipped, and empowered before he was even in the womb. So, of course, it tells us that, that a human life exists even before the womb. That's very important. And you can see where this is going. You can see the implications with abortion. And the thing is, behind abortion is an agenda. An agenda of destruction caused by Satan to hurt 
and destroy because the Bible tells us that's what Satan does. That's who he is. Now, to me, it would seem reasonable and logical that the burden of proof would have to be on the one in whom would prove that we should be able to do abortion and have abortions. And the burden of proof, they should be able to prove that it's not a life until whenever, a certain point. They should be able to prove that. And of course we know they can't do that. But it seems like if you're going to make a law that we can do that in, in, our, in our land, we would consider murder. That would be uh, something that would be against the law. So it seemed like you'd have to prove when life actually occurs in a baby in order to have a law that says it's okay to do that, which you can't do. And you may say, well, can you prove that there's a certain point where life exists? And it depends what a person means by can you prove that. But we can for sure say you can't prove it's not a life at all until any certain time. You can't prove that. But the Bible tells us the only one who really knows when that occurs is God himself. And he says before there's even anything in the womb, God already has a plan. He already has a calling. He already has it all set up, that person's life, even before, before they're in the womb. So now Jeremiah is saying that he was called, that he was ordained, that God equipped him. And so this speaks of the sovereignty of God, doesn't it? But I, I want you to think, Jeremiah is not the only guy or girl that has a, a calling that God has known before they're actually put together in the womb. Did you know every single one of us, God knew before we were put in the womb and had a plan for us, wired us a certain way, put us with the certain mom, certain family, certain location, certain thing God... He preordains all that stuff and He has a purpose and a plan for everything. Even before we, we have anything physical, it says here. And so we all should be encouraged to know that God has a plan for our life and it's so specific and spectacular that He made us fit the plan. So He made the plan and He made us to fit the plan. So if that be true, then what should we be doing? We should be asking God, so what's the plan? What's the plan? So, what, so that, that's what we should be doing because it's not until an individual seeks God for his life or her life, it's not until then that life will even make sense. So life becomes a, a matter of sort of floating around and trying to you know, sink your teeth into something, moving from thing to thing. But not until we put God in the center does anything make sense. You know, one of the worst things that can happen to a person is that they are successful at something that doesn't even matter. And it takes them away from God. So, in verse 6 it says, Then I said, Ah, Lord... Behold, I, I can't speak. I'm a youth. So he's anywhere that word suggests in the background of Josiah being the king, which he was the king at eight years old, and really got he was a good king, really got serious about things about when he was sixteen and started breaking down strongholds and started rebuilding the temple. But he was probably between seventeen and twenty five years old. So imagine being 17, 25 year old range. I have to imagine, really work hard at imagining that. But and imagine the Lord saying, I've, I've called you to do a certain thing. Well, if you're a believer, you don't have to imagine He has called you to do that. But the thing is, the normal, natural response is what we probably see here, what we find in ourselves is, no, not me. 
And God says, right, not you. Me in you. Is that a big difference? See, as believers, we, we should never buy into the thing where I can't do that. But what we sh instead, what we should be looking for is more what God's will is for me, praying about it, seeking Him first, and letting Him work those things out. And that then as He does, he, He's the one that does it through us. And a lot of times, it's even better if we don't have a natural talent or gift in a certain area, and then he calls us to do something. Moses comes to mind, right? It, it seemed like Moses wasn't very good at speaking. It seemed like that he knew that. He stuttered. And, and so God took something that was a problem, and God used it to bring glory. Because at the end of the day, it's God that gets the glory, right? And so... His strength is made perfect in our weakness. So we need to stop with the, the thing where I can't do it because I'm not this and I'm not that. But hey, wait a second. God can do it through me. Is there anything God can't do? There's not. So we just want to make sure it's the Lord. We don't want to go out and try to do things and copy people and say, oh, I like what that person, I want to do that. We have to seek the Lord and put Him first, and when we do that, then we'll find our way in what God has for us. So in verse 7, he says, But the Lord said to me, Do not say I'm a youth. In other words, don't make excuses for what I called you to do. He says, For, for you shall go to all to whom I send you. So now here's God sending him, right? So he's not just making things up and doing things on his own. God's saying, I'll send you. I'll put the words in your mouth. I'll sanctify you. I'll ordain you. For I shall send you, or you shall go to all who I, I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. So I'm going to tell you what to speak, and you speak that. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Because now God's saying, I'll give you the words now. And that's really what we want. That's what's so great about expository teaching, is we have God's Word. We're, we're safe. God's speaking to us in and through His Word. So we're seeing that. So God is very particular about how we do things. It's important that we do things His way. Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. In other words, God's saying, just surrender your thing to me and let me do my thing and you'll be blown away by what I do through you. But watch this. In verse 8 he says, Do not be afraid of their faces for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. So his ministry was such where he'd be called and really his whole ministry was to be obedient to the Lord. But there would be one, he'd have to get past this, this me syndrome and really relinquish control and let God do it through him. But then two, he had to get past the, the fear that he would have because people weren't going to like him. He had to get past the fear of compromising he had to get past the fear of uh, people, when you talk, they're going to look at you like they want to kill you. They're going to look at you like you're an idiot. They're going to look at you like they hate you. And they're going to have a disdainful look on their face, a disgusted look on their face. And God's saying, don't look at their faces. He's saying that, that look on their, on their face, don't let that stop you. And in other words, he had to be more in tune with what God said and wanted him to do than in the reaction he got from it. So he wasn't to go out and, and set up his ministry and talk in a certain way where everybody would think he's pretty snazzy and great. He was just to listen to the Lord and be obedient to the Lord, and that's it. So in verse 9, it says, then the Lord put forth his hand, and he touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. You know, 
that's a good thing to circle and pray and to remember. Lord, put your words in my mouth. He says, see, I, I have set this day, or I set, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms, and get this, to root out and to pull down, to destroy and throw down, to build and to plant. Now that's very interesting. Because what he's saying is, and this is what surprises people a lot of times. In order for God's work to work, in a lot of instances, he pulls down before he builds up. He takes away before he adds. Case in point was Gideon. He shrunk Gideon's army down from 30,000 to how many? 300. To go against about 150 or so Midianites. And he said, you know, some of, some of his weeding out process was, that if anybody is afraid to fight, you can leave. 10,000 left. And that's interesting, isn't it? And then he said, whoever goes down to the water, God told Gideon that, whoever goes down to the water and drinks in a certain way, let them go home too. And so, so there's a certain amount is either you drink to where you're lapping it like a dog with your hand. Or I'm sorry, you're, you're on your knee and you're looking around. The water is not your main thing. What God has for you to do is your main thing. But if people go over and they stick their head in the water and start drinking, then they're really, they're people who aren't ready for battle. They're more concerned about themselves and their comfort and drinking and, and their life, their personal life. They're more concerned about that than doing the Lord's work. But here's the interesting thing. You think, so God weeded all those people out and now they only have 300 and they have to go fight against these thousands of people. I mean, how is that even possible? The people, the 300 left, they didn't even fight. They didn't even fight. They got torches with jars and they broke the jars and God made the enemy kill each other themselves. God was just testing them to see if they would just honor God and be steadfast in God. But see... This is so critical to the work of God. Individually and corporately. God tears down first. What does He tear down? A lot of times there are strongholds in a community. There are strongholds in a church body. There are strongholds in our own life. And the Bible says it's the Word of God that breaks down those strongholds. So in a community, there are strongholds. I believe there are demons assigned to certain areas to keep hold of those areas. And I believe we're in an area where there's a, a hold that Satan has. And I believe the uh, specifics of that are Satan's keeping people in a lukewarm state to where they're going to church, but there's not a, a transformation in their life where they're hungering and thirsting after God. They're, they've been given just enough to be really passive in their walk with God, to be comfortable in their life and not want to push forward into the deeper things of God. I believe that's a big stronghold that Satan has. And I believe that God has called us here to be a part of shining the light and exposing some of those issues in people's lives where they've just gotten comfortably following the Lord and they're not really taking up the things that the Lord says and seriously following them in the deeper part of His calling. So Satan has strongholds. So if he has a, a stronghold, then, then he's going to tear down first. He has to sort of make the ground ready for better soil. So we all need to be real careful. I've seen this in our church ever since we've started. It, it goes through cycles. And I sense we're coming up on a, another cycle where Satan starts to attack. And we have to be grounded in the Word and certain about staying steadfast in our walks 
and committing to the things of the Lord. Otherwise, we're not going to make it. I've seen that. I've been here for 14 years. I've seen it for 14 years. It's the same thing. And God did that a couple years ago, and now we're flourishing again. There's things, there's a working of God, and I sense Satan starting to come in again. I sense that we have to guard against getting complacent. We have to guard against worldliness, division, and introspection to where we're just looking inward and forgetting our calling to the lost world. We have to be very careful. We're getting to a time like that. We're getting to a time where I, I sense Satan doing it again. But I think the previous pruning has made us a people who are ready for this. Who are the Gideons 300? Who are ready to say, Amen. Let's see what God wants to do. It's not about me. It's not about my thing. It's not about anybody's thing, but the Lord's thing. And willing to sacrifice our own personal interests for the greater glory of what God wants. So Satan comes and he, he starts to mess. He starts to disturb. He starts to do things. And then people get restless and they get their focus on the, off the Lord and get it on themselves and everything wrong. And next thing you know, we got a problem. But see, here's another thing. We may be doing really well corporately or individually, but God wants to do more. And you know how He does more a lot? He prunes, doesn't He? See, sometimes it's not just, you know, God has to weed out people who aren't really serious, but sometimes people are really doing well. He prunes us so we can be more fruitful. Because at the end of the day, God's really interested in, our, in us being fruitful. He's called us to bear fruit and that more Abundantly. He's called us. That's the purpose to bear spiritual fruit. So what happens to bear spiritual fruit? We have to, sometimes we have to get pruned. Some of you may be being pruned right now. You, don't know, you didn't know that till right now, but you're like, man, what is, what's going on? It's just all this stuff. You're being pruned. You're being pruned for more, for more fruit. So that's a good thing. Don't, don't, lose your patience in the trial. Stay in it. Let patience have its perfect work. Because if I could be really candid with you guys, part of that cycle of things that happen, what happens is people will come here and for whatever reason they may be excited at first. And maybe they haven't been to a church that teaches the Word, or maybe they can't find something or whatever. Or maybe they're mad at their old church, so now they're happy. But please don't tell me things about your old church. That's not good. It's not good for you. It's not good for anybody. But here's the thing that happens. It's one thing to get excited. It's one thing to move forward. It's one thing, but there's going to come a time. It's not always going to be great. Like you, like you, the, it's not always going to be the mountaintop. Don't be the person that keeps going to the edge of the promised land, then you get your feathers ruffled, and then you go to another church, and you're all excited until you get to that same place. Because you know what? If you don't pass the test, God is going to keep putting you in that same place until you pass the test. And the test is probably has something to do with you. And you may have been pointing the finger at everybody else and saying that church or that person or those people or that. And, and maybe you have Limburger on your mustache. <laughs> cheese. Maybe you have smelly cheese on your mustache. <laughs> I got that from course and I didn't make that up. But it, it's an incredible analogy. It's a funny story. Uh, one time, I know she wouldn't mind me saying this, but I'm not going to say her name. She doesn't go to church anymore here because she moved. But a lot of you know her, and she's great. But um, one time, she, she did worship, and she did the keyboards. And I got a text, and she said, 
I think something died at church. Like it smells really bad in church. There's something in the ceiling or under the stage. And it was right before service. And I'm like, oh, great. Like, you know, a rat or something died and the whole place smells. And I'm like, oh, no, what are we going to do? And then um, I'm like, oh, Paul will take care of it. But <laughs> I get down here and she goes, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so sorry. But it was weird because I thought I smelled it over there. But then I went over there and it smelled there. And then I went over there and it smelled there. And she stepped in dog stuff. And she was walking around and smelling that, and she thought the church smelled. But anyway, the, the analogy is perfect. The analogy is perfect. Sometimes it may be we just have dog stuff on our shoe, and we think everybody else and everything else is the problem. But we have to take off our shoes or something. The point is, and like I said, I'm being really candid because I want to be real specific about this because I think this is what Satan does over and over again. He gets people to a place where they're confronted with certain issues in their heart because God wants to take them further. He wants to take them deeper. And then these certain things come up and it's, they're in the same place, and they're, they have a choice. We have a choice. And we're going to say, you know what? Not this time. I'm not going to run. I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to let God see me through this. There's no grass is greener on the other side. And I'm not saying we're the only church. I'm not saying that. But if God's called you here and you appreciate the way we do things here and you're growing and, you know, don't look for, for an excuse to run away because it's easier. Somebody else is, is, you know, it's at another church where you're not going to be put in a position because God uses the body for that. Did you know that? He uses the body to grow us. And a lot of times it's by getting our feathers ruffled. And we realize some things that are in our own heart. Sometimes we realize that I, I got this problem and it's, I need to be humble. I need to handle things biblically. I need to go to that person or I need to do, just handle things biblically because the glory of God is more important than our comfort. But the good thing about that is God wants to grow us all and He uses the body for that. And so just, just remember, so there's a tearing down. Okay, you may be in a tearing down or a building up phase right now. Tearing down or building up phase. But God does that. They're both. But you and I can't be built up until we're torn down. The church can't be built up until it's torn down. Our community, if we're going to have an effect on our community, there's got to be some tearing down before there's building up. It's just the way God works. But Jeremiah is saying, that's what I'm called to do. That was his ministry. So imagine if, if God gave him that ministry and he started looking at people's faces and he didn't like the way they were looking at him. So he said, you know, I'm going to soften the message a little bit. I'm going to say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. I'm going to say, everything's fine. And then all the people's faces start smiling. And then they start patting Jeremiah on the back. And the world starts loving Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is seen as this wonderful guy. And yet everybody is going down the tube spiritually. But they don't know it. See, he didn't have any response or result positively. But God used his preaching so they knew what they were doing. Did you know the Bible's good for that too? Not just building us up, but even if we don't have a response, we're held accountable now for the truth and how we act upon the truth. So, verse, 10, verse 11, he says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me. So I want you to see the stressing of the word of the Lord, how important the word of the Lord is. It came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And he said, I see a branch of an almond tree. And then the Lord said to me, you have 
seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. So this almond tree, what's an almond tree? An almond tree was known as a tree of awakening because they'd be the first tree that blossomed. They had, uh, in the Middle East, they'd blossom a lot of times in January and it'd signal like spring is coming, but it'd be the first tree. And God is saying to Jeremiah, he's seeing if, if Jeremiah is seeing things spiritually, Instead of, imagine getting all that information that he got and imagine how easy it would to be just say, no, I mean, I hope none of us, but it's pretty common to neglect or not listen to the word of the Lord or, or maybe God's calling us to do something, but it, we can just push it off and ignore it. Real easy. I'm really good at that. Sometimes God gets me in a place where I can't ignore it anymore. But he was seeing, do you see what I do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? What he's saying? And he did. So he is seeing spiritually, he is hearing from the Lord. And and so God was saying through this vision of the almond tree, he said, Okay, now it's time. What's time? You you remember the book of Isaiah? We've been reading that, right? And now he's saying, Now it's time. Now it's time to perform. Now it's time. The word has been there. It's set in place, but now it's time that that thing is going to be unleashed. So he tells him that, and, and he gives him the word. But see, the word of God is like that for us all too. So sometimes it seems so long. Sometimes it seems like it's not going to happen. But remember, God, he works on a time frame. He has a schedule how he works everything out. And so when that second shoe drops... I mean, it's just when God doesn't hasten anymore, when it's time, it's just, it's on. So, it's on. So, what is, the, what is the second thing he says? He says in verse 13, And the word of the Lord came to me a second time, saying, What do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot, and it is facing away from the north. So, now he sees a, a boiling pot in verse 14. And the Lord said to me, Out of the north calamity shall break forth on all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, says the Lord. They shall come, and each one set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem against all its walls all around and against all the cities of Judah, I will utter my judgments against them concerning all their wickedness. Why? Because they have forsaken me. They have burned incense to other gods and worship the works of their own hands. So now the almond tree says the time is ready. The boiling pot says judgment is coming. And he says it's coming from the north, which is interesting because Babylon is the one that's judging them. And they're not in the north, but they're in the east. So why is it com coming from the north? Because it's, you can't really travel from the east to the west to get to Jerusalem. It's the roads and uh, it's, the terrain is not travelable, so you have to go north and then come down. But now he's saying this is what's going to happen. So, so imagine this now. And we have this now too. We have the word of the Lord. So the, the word of the Lord in our day right now is telling us that judgment's coming. And not only is the word of the Lord very clear and explicit and how exactly all that's going to go down. And now even today we're watching stuff. On the news. I mean, we're seeing stuff every day. So judgment is coming. Thank God the rapture is coming before the judgment's coming. But the thing is, we have to ask ourselves, are we really ready for that? Are we really living our life? Peter said that in light of the coming of the Lord, or in light of the fact that the earth is going to melt with a fervent heat, in light of that, what manner of people should we be? In other words, how should we live our life? And, and I, I think that's so important that we're aware of the events that are going on in the world and what the Bible says about that. 
so we can be encouraged, but we would also live our life in such a way where we know Jesus could come back in any second. And what if he doesn't? Well, we don't have long to live on earth anyway. Even if we die a natural death, I mean, how long is that? It's not that long compared to eternity. So one way or the other, our time is short, and we'll stand before God one day, so we're to live our life like that. So in verse 17, it says, Therefore prepare yourself and arise, and speak to them all that I command you. Do not be dismayed before their faces, lest I dismay you before them. For behold, I have made you this day a fortified city and an iron pillar. So the Lord is telling Jeremiah, your word is not, not going to be like droplets of candy that you're dispensing. The people aren't going to like it, but don't worry about it. I'm protecting you. He says in bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah and its princes and its, against its priests and against the people of the land. Now that's very interesting. Because Jeremiah, who is speaking the word of God, the truth of God, is now going to be attacked and come, people are going to come against them and it says it's going to be the kings, which you might kind of expect that. But it's going to be the, the princes, but then it's going to be the priests as well. Shouldn't the priests know the word of God too? Isn't that interesting? And we see this all throughout the Bible, and we specifically see it all throughout Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah. It's the, the rotten priesthood. The corruption, the worldliness has gotten down into the church, into the, the people who are supposed to be a witness for God. People, The priests were supposed to stand before the people for God. And they were supposed to stand before God for the people. They're the middleman. And now what happens when that gets corrupt? There's, there's nowhere to go anymore. What happens when the church gets worldly? When the church doesn't proclaim the truth? I just read where Azusa Pacific University, has anybody ever heard of that? It's a pretty well-known Southern California Christian college that they, they just um, made it so that you can have a homosexual relationship and it's in, in their code of ethics, which is that's okay to do that now. And that's, so we're seeing that now within the Christian colleges now. Of course, many of the Ivy League schools were Christian colleges when they were set up their uh, theological schools and now they're completely worldly and secular. So what do you do in light of that? What do you do? Well, we have to be Jeremiah's. We have to be courageous. We have to speak the truth in love. But we have to be oh so careful that we don't buy into the lies of our world which is trying to brainwash us and program us and especially our kids and younger people into thinking that the things that God said are not relative or pertinent to the times we live in now. That is a real danger that we face. The only thing that we have to tell us what the difference is, is the Word of God. So we have to study it. We have to be into it. We have to expect God to reveal the truth and give us opportunities to speak the truth. To stand, Because if we don't do it, who's going to do it? It has to be the church. That's our purpose. See, like the children of Israel, we are called in the same way. They were to be a group of people who were set apart to bear witness to God so all the nations would know God. Instead, they went into the other nations' gods and worshipped them and failed in their calling. We can't do that. Because we're called in the same way, to be a light into the world. How are we a light into the world? We stand on the truth. So then we'll just finish with this tonight. In verse 19 he says, They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. Why? For I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you.
So we live in interesting times. And I think it would do us well. And I would like to, um, as we go through the book of Jeremiah a little more, I'd like to have more prayer time in the beginning. Because we really need to pray. We really need to hear from God. We really need to be on our knees for our loved ones, for our prodigals, for those who are stuck, that we could be all that God's called us to be. So we're off and running. Book of Jeremiah, chapter 1. I know a lot of nuggets in there. There's a, uh, just before we finish, it says in Jeremiah, a little later on, it says that they lived in a time where they didn't blush anymore. In other words, they had gotten so used to sin, things that would be embarrassing, things that would make people blush, things that they had zero reaction to them. And I see that now. The things that, that are acceptable and that people say, look at, a lot of times they don't even think it's wrong or see it as wrong. And it's just vile. It's dark and vile and evil. And a lot of times even Christians are getting into things. They don't even see a problem with that. So God bless you guys for hanging in there tonight. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless and write this scripture on our hearts. Sound good? Lord, we thank you for you are good. We thank you that your word is a lamp into our feet, like we said, Lord. And we do pray for our church, Lord. We pray that you would sustain us, protect us, use us, help us to be fruitful, and to fulfill all the purposes that you have for our body, Lord. I pray for that uh, for us as individuals, Lord. That each one of us would take personal responsibility for our personal relationship with you. I pray, Lord, that we would see our relationship with you as the thing, the primary thing. That we would be protective of that relationship. That we would guard it. We wouldn't let anything come in between it, Lord. I pray for anybody here who's lukewarm, lethargic, in... Um, in selfishness, in self-righteousness. Someone is just consumed with, uh, they just can't stop thinking about themselves, Lord. And I pray that you'd help all of us to take up our cross and deny ourselves and follow you, Lord. I pray for those tonight that are hurting, that are struggling, that are brokenhearted, confused, fearful, Lord. I pray that they would take courage and hope in you today. I pray that their hearts would be lifted up into the things above, knowing that they are in this world and will have tribulation, but you have overcome this world, Lord. I pray that we'd be a fruitful church. I pray that there would be a revival here, Lord. I pray that there would be a a feeling of expectancy, Lord, when we come to church. And Lord, I pray as you go to and fro the earth that you would find faith in us, the faith that you give us, Lord. And help us in our unbelief. Lord, fill us, bless us, keep us, and make your face shine upon us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.